I'm Richard Taylor from the Philosophy Department at Marquette University, and this is the second video on Mill's Utilitarianism for Philosophy 2310, Theory of Ethics, here at Marquette. And I'm going to divide this up into two videos for this, uh, this class, for our next class. Uh, I think it's a little easier for students to deal with. Uh, for uh, quick opportunities, you can watch these videos on your phones or whatever you like. Uh, other tablets and things like that. So I think I'll try to start dividing these videos into something a little smaller that allows for uh, a, a, um, an opportunity to watch these in whenever you have a few minutes free. That might make it a little bit more convenient. At any rate, let's start now with uh, Chapter 3 of Mill's Utilitarianism. And Chapter 3, as the title indicates, is on the sanction of the principle of utility, the ultimate sanction. By sanction, we mean what's, what provides the justification uh, for something. And so we talk about putting sanctions or limitations of certain kinds on things too. Uh, politically we talk about putting sanctions, uh, uh, currently sanctions on Iranian activity and that sort of thing, uh, economic sanctions. So it's penalties, but also it can mean uh, uh, things that compel someone to act in a certain way. So the question is what compels us? Or what is the ultimate sanction of the principle of utility according to Mill? Now, the ex he ex talks ex extensively about the external sanctions, and those are pretty obvious. The police uh, give us tickets if we drive on the wrong side of the road or we drive too fast. That's an external sanction. Society thinks badly of us if we don't act appropriately in situations such as taking, taking care of someone who's fallen on the sidewalk. If we just walk on by and watch somebody bleeding on the sidewalk, people would not think well of us. And so uh, that's another sanction. We want to fit in with the rest of society and uh, be among our friends. And we want our friends to think well of us. We want the entire society to think well of us. And so that's another external sanction. It's outside of us. And similarly, then, with regard to God, we think that, well, God will reward or punish us for, for our actions. These are external sanctions as well. <clears throat> Pardon me. So the sanctions, though, which often can be much more powerful, are internal sanctions. That is, that are found right inside ourselves, that prompt us to act in certain ways. And, and Mill thinks that there are internal powerful internal sanctions that uh, encourage us, push us along, uh, propel us, as it were, to act in accordance with utilitarian standards. And of course, the utilitarian standard is expressed in the mantra that I've spoken to you about in class, and that is the notion that uh, we all must always seek as utilitarians the greatest good for the greatest number. And again, as I said in class, then this notion of the greatest good for the greatest number, when you're pondering a question in regard to utilitarianism, I think at least a quarter of the time, maybe more, you'll be helped in understanding the sense of what's going on if you just remind yourself of the utilitarian mantra, greatest good for greatest number, where good means pleasure. And the greatest number means the greatest number of human beings. So the internal sanctions. So the question here is, what is the nature of the internal sanction which makes us think in utilitarian terms? And what Mill finds is that it's in, the con in our conscience. And our conscience has been formed through education by parents and others, and generally then formed by society. That the certain values are put in our conscience. So conscience is the notion that, that we feel bad if we steal something, we feel bad for a while. Or if we lie to someone, we feel bad. And the utilitarian consideration of this is, well, we violated something with regard to another person, uh, and, uh, uh, and we feel bad inside. And there's a kind of feeling in the mind. And I think he describes it rather well. So he says, the internal sanction of duty, whatever our standard of duty may be, is one and the same, a feeling in our mind. So we feel bad. He goes on to say, though, it's a, kind, it's a pain, more or less intense, attendant on, that is following, the violation of duty. And he means moral duty here. So when we don't follow our moral duty, like telling the truth to a friend, then we have a bad feeling, a feeling in the mind that makes us feel bad. He goes on to describe this by saying, it's a violation of duty which in properly cultivated moral natures rises in the more serious cases into shrinking from it as an impossibility. That is, if we're properly raised and properly cultured, our minds and our moral natures, we avoid 
having this, this terrible pain in our minds and, and make it an impossibility then that we would lie or that we would steal or that sort of thing. So that's what he means when he says here that, that you know, which in properly cultivated moral natures rises in the more serious cases into shrinking from it as an impossibility. So perhaps uh, you, you, might, you might take $10 that belongs to your, uh, to your roommate that you found on the floor. But would you really take $10,000 from your roommate or $100 from your roommate? No. We'd shrink it. That would be impossible even to think of. And uh, we would feel so bad about having, having done this. So it, it makes us act in a way that we wouldn't even consider the possibility. And that's what he means by conscience. And this sanctions us. This is, it, it, it guides our actions. And it gives us a penalty, as it were, if we act in the, in the wrong way. And that wrong way is the way contrary to the way our minds have been formed. That is contrary to our conscience. So he says this. This feeling, when disinterested, and he means it's not, you don't have any special interest in it. You're just a general feeling here. When disin you're not doing something for yourself. So this feeling when disinterested and connecting itself with the pure idea of duty and not with some particular form of it or with any, with any of the merely accessory circumstances is the essence of conscience. So separate it off as a pure idea and the essence of conscience is this feeling in the mind that, that keeps us from doing bad things or, or, or assaults us, so to speak, when we do bad things. And then we feel very bad about it, and the next time perhaps we won't do it. This then, this feeling in the mind, which uh, is an, connected with the idea of duty, that is moral duty, what we ought to do for other people in society, if we want the greatest good for the greatest number. So if this is the essence of conscience, according to Mill. That's a very good point, I think. And he goes on to say, and I want to explain this in some detail, that's why I have the text here. He goes on to say, if there be anything innate in the matter... Now, by innate, he means it's already in the mind uh, and not learned from the world. And he says if there's anything innate, which he doesn't really think there is, but if there's anything innate, I see no reason why the feeling which is innate should not be that of regard to the pleasures and pains of others. Now, notice what he's doing here. The innate feeling, then, is that we have a concern for the pleasures and pains of others. That's really what's behind this. He's going to talk about that a little bit further on in this chapter. But this is very important. And it's connected to the notion that we saw in Hume when I discussed Hume in the beginning of the first video. So Hume's, Hume thought that what really compels us to work together in a society is our sympathy and our feelings for our sympathy or sympathetic feelings for other human beings. So I'll go on here then. So, uh, uh, I see, he says, I see no reason why the feeling which is innate uh, should not be that of regard for pleasures and pains of others. If there is any, mor any principle of morals which is intuitively obligatory, I should say that it must be that. Now, what he means by intuitively obligatory, we already know it's an obligation. He's sort of hinting at the idea that Kant has, that we already know before experience any... Uh, uh, we already know our obligations toward others, our duties toward others. He doesn't really mean that uh, here because he thinks it's all learned. But if you want to say that there's something innate, it really is the innate desire for pleasures and pain, pleasures and avoidance of pain, that we in some way, because of our social sympathies, we'll see that later, because of our social sympathies, our care for other people in the social context, then we will not do things against other people. So it's almost innate. It's almost as if it's built into us. But in fact, it's turn, it turns out, according to Mill, to be something we've learned. So moral feelings. Here's Mill's view, and he states it very clearly. He says, My own belief, the moral feelings are not innate, but are acquired. They are not, for that reason, the less natural. So our moral feelings, he thinks, are in some sense natural, but they're not innate. They're acquired. And by acquired, he means that they're learned in the context of society. And of course, they're going to be learned and encouraged by parents to care about other people, to act as a good citizen, etc., and taught to children in that fashion. So they're not innate, but they're acquired. And so the, these, these moral feelings are trained in us by our parents and our society. 
However, Mill does not think there is a natural basis of sentiment for utilitarian morality. That's what he says. I'm sorry, he says there is. I misspoke that. Mill, Mill does think there is a natural basis of sentiment for utilitarian morality. And this is the connection with David Hume. I mentioned before that Hume brings up the notion of social sentiment and when he rejects the idea of some kind of implicit contract we make with, to cooperate with everybody in society. He said, Mill, uh, Hume says there's no such contract, but rather it's on the basis of our feeling, and that feeling is natural to us as the social animals we are. Mill goes on to write then, but there is this basis of powerful natural sentiment. The word sentiment is feeling. It just means feeling. There is that, but there is this basis of natural of powerful natural sentiment, and that it is which, when once the general happiness is recognized as the ethical standard, will constitute the strength of the utilitarian morality. So once we recognize that the general happiness, the greatest good for greatest number, is the ethical standard, then in fact we'll see that this feeling is a foundation for the strength of the utilitarian morality of greatest good for greatest number. <clears throat> he goes on to say this, this firm foundation is that of social feelings of mankind. See, this is what I, what I this is why I brought up Hume earlier. So it isn't that isn't just everything greatest good for greatest number and it's all pleasure, but there's also something very important here in the social feelings of mankind and how we care for one another as social animals. He goes on. The desire to be in unity with our fellow creatures, which is already a powerful principle in human nature, and happily one of those which tend to become stronger, even without express inculcation, from the advances of from the influences of advancing civilization. So the more civilization we have, the closer we are, and the better we regard human beings as valuable, and we come to have stronger and stronger concern for our fellow human beings. And we enjoy that, because that's what we are. We're social animals. That's what he's drawing upon here. He goes on to say, to state it this way then, uh, to finish that quotation, the social state is at once so natural, so necessary, and so habitual to man. Now pause. It's naturally developed by us as the social animals we are. It's necessary for us to live in society as groups and not as individuals, not as radical individuals. And it's habitual to us because we're trained to act this way by our parents and others as we learn and grow up. So the social state is at once so natural, so necessary, and so habitual to man that except in some unusual circumstances or by an effort of voluntary abstraction, and by abstraction means separation, so somebody voluntarily goes off to become a hermit, that's what he has in mind, he goes on, he never, he never, a person never conceives himself otherwise than as a member of a body. I think of myself in a social context. I'm a member of a family. I'm a member of the community. I'm a member of the Marquette faculty. I'm a member of the Marquette community. I'm a member of the city of Milwaukee. I conceive of this all in this way, and that's how I conceive of myself. He goes on, and this association is riveted more and more as mankind are farther, further removed from the state of savage independence. So the more we're away from that notion of, of uh, dog-eat-dog kind of thing that I indicated in the first video was the, concern of, was the concern about the state of nature, where justice is whatever the stronger can get. A notion that I pointed out was discussed in Plato's Republic. Plato himself didn't accept it, but one of the characters there discussed it. We talked about, I talked about that with regard to Gyges the Lydian, and also we saw it in Thomas Hobbes, the notion that we are all in a state of nature. And Mill isn't buying it, okay? He isn't buying that we're, we're separate. We always conceive of ourselves as part of a social group. And we look for the approval of social groups as well. So, as social animals, we require training of feelings. Okay, we, so we train other social animals. We train children. We train their feelings. They should feel good or bad about something. Someone falls down and slips on the sidewalk. You don't laugh at the person. You don't teach children to laugh at the misfortunes of others. You teach them to care about other people. So he goes on to say, quote, 
The deeply rooted conception of which every individual, and even now has of himself as a social being, tends to make him feel it one of his natural wants that there should be harmony between his feelings and aims and those of his fellow creature, creatures. So we think our desires, wants, needs should be in accord with anybody else. And we watch others as we're children, especially we watch others, we learn from them, we learn how to be the kinds of people that we are, and we want to be social beings. And as much as we want to say, I'm a rugged individual, nevertheless, we always say that we want to be part of the social group. It makes us feel good. And of course, no surprise, because we are social animals. But the point is that, again, this is not innate. Okay, we want to be very clear about that. It's not innate. So the ultimate sanction here for Mill is conscience. And conscience, then, is something that, that the notions behind conscience is something that's trained into us by habituation and education by our parents. So this is the end of chapter three. I'm going to stop the video here and start the video for chapter four uh, right after this. And uh, we'll see how short this is and whether it fits better with your way of, uh, way of preparing for the course. If you can quickly watch a, a video for 15 minutes or so and uh, uh, get oriented toward the course and then do other things. But the point is I'm going to try to aim for shorter videos. So we'll see how it goes.